Vancouver is located on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. In 2013, the Vancouver City Council formally acknowledged that the city was founded on lands that, quote, were never ceded through treaty, war, or surrender, 127 years after Vancouver was founded. Where Are We in the World features sites around the Lower Mainland shaped by often ignored or hidden histories of struggle and agency. I can't remember the English name, but the people called it the Greasy Spoon. And a lot of people ate there. And then farther down on the, um, on the west side of Main Street, there was like the Bamboo Terrace, the WK, and, and then the Ho-Ho, and farther down was um, the Ho Inn. Yen Lock, On Lock, ate at all those places. Weekends, you can't barely walk on the sidewalks. There were six deep, uh, you know, you literally have to walk outside the sidewalk to the street to get, you know, get, get through the flow of traffic. So, I mean, that's how things were those days. It was a very vibrant place. It's just a whole comfort level. I don't know, you know, you know this is a whole identity. A, a sense of comfort, a sense of feeling of home. I think as you're walking around Chinatown, one of the important lessons is that it's a place that still has this character of Chinese ethnicity, of food, and it's got still the smells. Uh, but as you're seeing the buildings and as you think about its history, uh, you're really being reminded that it sits on a long history of struggle against racism. So you could say that the contests and struggles of Chinatown are a symbolic marker that's still with us if we forget those years of struggle and we kind of lose our Chinatown, we literally forget who we are and where we are in the world. In 1907, there was a riot in Chinatown. The rioters who were basically organizing around white supremacy. So they wanted labor unions to be only white and excluding non-white workers, and in particular Chinese and Japanese and Indo-Canadian workers. And next thing you know, uh, they start hurling rocks and they broke the windows and people just charged, they beat up people, you know, they ransacked the place. And they just went one down, all the way down from Main Street, all the way down to Shanghai Alley, and then they turned on Abbott Street and start marching uh, on Powell Street towards Japantown. I think the myth is that after the Second World War, the Chinese got the vote and everything was hunky-dory. Well, it wasn't. Well, I graduated from school in 1957, and I wanted to become a bank clerk. So I went to the bank in Chinatown, and I said, I'd like to work as a bank clerk. And he looks at me, he says, Oh, you can't work for the bank. I said, why? Because you're Chinese. <laughs> what, what difference does that make? I can speak English. And that was the cruel reality of being a Chinese in the 1960s, was that you still have this leftover of racial discrimination. And it was just terrible, but we had to cope with it. You have to remember, up to the Second World War, Chinese weren't even allowed to buy land outside of Chinatown and Strathcona. But in the 1950s, the city was planning a third crossing. It was a $200 million project at the time, but it would have been a third crossing from the North Shore. It would have had a waterfront freeway where Coal Harbor and, you know, sits today. I mean, can you imagine that as a freeway, elevated freeway or a waterfront freeway? And if that had happened, it would split Chinatown in half and it were, you know, Chinatown would never be the way it is. So if you think about it that way, it was very, very serious. Chinatown was literally fighting for everything that it had. It was, you know, it was going to be, you know, it was not going to be anything ever again. During phases one and two, um, the petitions fell on deaf ears and we began to see more and more of our community as empty lots. Now we're talking about in the 60s when they expropriated these places. They were giving them six to $8,000 for the house. Essentially what they're saying is that we're not giving you enough money to go and buy another house anywhere else in the city. We want you out. 
as that freeway was being planned, the people who lived in Strathcona, who were by then mostly Chinese, and the Chinatown merchants, got together with other people from the city and they blocked it. I mean, they protested the freeway and eventually the freeway was not built. So for us, Chinatown is integral. There you've got the commercial strip on Pender. It's only a, a short three blocks long, but that short three blocks had a lot of our community's um, sweat in it. You see, there's always these very innocuous, very innocent rules and laws and regulations that they use, but they would use it, they would use it in a way to victimize the community. And what I'm saying is that uh, during the 70s, um, uh, because they say that, you know, if you have cooked meat, it has to be either 140 you know, degrees or it has to be under 40 degrees. So these uh, health inspectors armed with thermometers came into Chinatown, poked them into the uh, um, you know, the barbecue ducks and, and stuff and just start closing them all down. The struggle over barbecue pork was actually pretty indicative of, of some of the strange ways in which Chinatown had to resist uh, the power of the city. You can see the, you know, this whole kind of context. It wasn't that they were enforcing rules to help to preserve, to protect your safety. It was protecting a certain form of ritual custom that was very European and uh, colonized European kind of context. But I'll tell you, if they didn't fight this, today you will not be able to eat roast duck, barbecue pork, barbecue chicken. You cannot buy that in any, any outlet right now in Vancouver. Chinatown actually wasn't just a space where Chinese lived. It's in, been an incredibly mixed place right from the beginning. So for instance, because a lot of the Chinese um, were men in the early decades of uh, the 20th century, um, there weren't a lot of Chinese Canadian women. And so many of the waitresses in restaurants, for instance, were Aboriginal women who had come to Vancouver from various communities all around British Columbia or Alberta. My name is uh, Helen Caldreth. And uh, my father's uh, family name was Hong, so I, I grew up known as Helen Hong. Oh, I better say my Chinese name first, Hong Yet Heng. And my Aboriginal name is Thawakawet. My dad's name was um, Hong Tim Heng. And the people down here, the, the Asian community, called him Chief. I believe it was because he was married to an Aboriginal woman. My brothers and I, my brother, older brother Gordy and Larry and I, we went to Chinese school. One of my best friends was Italian, his name was John Minicello. And uh, he invited me over to his house for dinner one day. So anyway, they fed me this wonderful pasta dinner. And the father said, oh, he says, and he had a, uh, a bottle of wine. He said, try some of my homemade wine, he said, you know. So he poured me a glass and that was the first time I had to drink wine because I was a guest at a dinner in this Italian family. And here I was 10 years old and it wasn't bad. I rather enjoyed it. <laughs> One of my first um, childhood friends lived up up in this uh, Arno Rooms hotel with their mother and um, and there was a few East Indians that lived there. That's where I had my first taste of curry. And I've liked curry ever since. The hotter, the better. <laughs> Chinatown, back when, when I was a, a, a youngster, yeah, it, was, it was fun being around, living in Chinatown. Yeah. Especially in uh, Chinese New Year, they'd have the, they'd have the, um, the parade. And I remember the, firecrackers. They had a whole string of firecrackers that they'd set up, you know, from from the top of the building all the way down and it would burn. There's a long history of Chinatown as this very racially and ethnically mixed space, and it still is to this day. I would go down 
uh, to one of our favorite Chinese stores and I would go in there to the chicken shop holding my breath most of the time. I remember going with my mother. I mean, she'd nudge me with her elbow and say, don't do that, because I'd be going, right? So, uh, because the smell I would find overwhelming. You do get used to it if you've been in there for a while. And you could go and choose your fresh chicken and they would kill it for you right there. You know, yes, I'd like a chicken. I'd like it to be about, you know, so many um, pounds. And they'd take it and they'd be squawking and flapping and the feathers would be flying everywhere. And so that would be, you know, one of your typical days of going out to bring home a whole chicken, fresh chicken for the family supper. It's uh, pretty special won't experience that anymore when I say, well, I want people to experience some of that heritage. I don't think I quite mean that, but having fresh chicken today still means a lot, even though it's uh, coming out of the fridge and the freezer now in Chinatown. Now there's like maybe a half a dozen eateries in Chinatown, it's pathetic and they're all slowly disappearing anyhow. With the construction of the new high-rise being built in Chinatown, I think that will change the character of Chinatown completely. I don't think it'll be that friendly village that I grew up in. Chinatown today, you know, has, is undergoing a new phase of change. Many of the people have left the Strathcona neighborhood. What's happening is a lot of uh, glass towers, and Vancouver's famous for the you know, condominiums that are big, high glass towers that are sort of hip places to live. And if they come in, uh, there's no turning the clock back. Once these, this sort of historic district's gone, then Chinatown will look like every other part of Vancouver. And so that history of uh, struggle and of uh, fighting back in some ways for ex just for existence uh, will be lost. This was a very important part of the larger Vancouver community and Chinatown belongs to everybody in the city. If you don't understand your history of who you are and where you come from, how can you become a part of the present and the future? You know, that's very, very critical for anybody. Chinatown is a her national heritage site now. We've been fortunate enough to have that designation, but we need to do more than just have a label and we need more than just a plaque on the street on a, on a boulder. Um, we need it to be thriving and alive. So this is a place where we can mark where we came from and who we are today and where we're going.